If it feels like things are getting worse, it's because unfortunately, in many ways they are. While there are certainly things in our lives that have improved, that have gotten better, we're facing an unprecedented rise of authoritarianism. Censorship, book bannings, the bannings of websites. Whenever there's a major tragedy, we'll see the media dangle extremism in front of the face of the public. They'll tell you that you're threatened and the people will respond by yelling, save us. In response, we'll see information get restricted and this almost always backfires on the public. Today, we have a media demanding the restriction of certain information, siding with far left activists and identitarian activists to censor speech, all because of a rare and extreme act. These same people in media themselves pump out fake news. I hate to say it, but it's not just that we're standing at the gates of a nightmarish future dystopia, but we've already walked inside and it would seem like things are getting worse. Today, let's take a look at some of the latest news and I'll walk you down the nightmare future dystopia path so you can see what's really happening. But before we get started, please subscribe to our new YouTube channel, youtube.com slash subverse videos. The goal of this channel is to produce straight laced news, expert interviews, and on the ground reporting to cut through the spin and the bias to the best of our abilities. If you like this video, just share it on social media to help spread the message. What happened in New Zealand was a horrifying tragedy. A story from the Washington Post highlights how YouTube struggles to shut down the video of the New Zealand massacre and that humans were outsmarting its systems. The story itself is rather straightforward that this video should be blocked and people should not be allowed to see it. But the way the story is framed is rather interesting. The presumption is that we already agree people should not have the ability to see this and understand what's happening. They talk about how a team worked through the night trying to identify and remove tens of thousands of videos, many repackaged or recut versions of the original footage that showed the horrific murders. As soon as the group took down one, Another would appear as quickly as one per second in the hours after the shooting, Mohan said in an interview. But should people have a right to this information to see what happened? Or should the information be restricted? What's truly terrifying about this moment is that according to the manifesto of this man who perpetrated this heinous act, it was to incite the culture war, to push Americans towards violence, to get the left to call for curtailing free speech, expression, and the right to bear arms, so that the right would have no choice but to respond in kind. And the media has done exactly what this man wanted in a rather terrifying fashion. Following news of the censorship of this information, we've seen that Jordan Peterson's book was removed from one of the largest book distributors. While at the same time, books from other individuals, including white nationalists, are still available from the same company. The knee-jerk reaction doesn't seem to be following any kind of logic. It's just trying to shut down those who might actually push back against the rhetoric. And we've also seen the blocking of certain websites, something that we only ever thought we would see in dictatorships or from despots. One website called Turkey Blocks maps social media blackouts. Iran has blocked access to social media tools for years. And in China, they've censored certain words relating to Tiananmen Square and other controversial ideas in their country. Yet today, we're seeing the same thing now happen in Western nations where we never thought it would be possible. 4chan, 8chan blocked by Australian and New Zealand ISPs for hosting shooting video. Widespread website blocking being used to limit spread of terror attack video. And the logic is exactly the same. These countries, Iran, Turkey, China, they block information under the same premise. It's disturbing, it's distressing, it goes against public order. And now we see the same thing affecting Western nations. The important thing to consider is not necessarily that people are demanding censorship, but that the presumption among journalists and the media class is that censorship is already what people want. Oliver Darcy said on Twitter, I wrote about how vaccine misinformation is still flourishing on Facebook and Instagram weeks after the platform's promised crackdown. Insta Spox told me they are taking some short-term measures but said process has always been scheduled to take weeks. In response, we've seen this story from the Daily Mail. Instagram will block anti-vaxxer hashtags in crackdown on medical fake news on the social media site. Instagram bosses said they will minimize recommendations of this content. Short-term measures include blocking hashtags like vaccines cause autism, but it may take several weeks for the ban to come into effect. I'm certainly no fan of anti-vaxxers or people who push misinformation. But this does present us with a nightmarish problem. I remember when cigarettes were considered healthy. The story from Adweek, Throwback Thursday, 
when doctors prescribed healthy cigarette brands. I remember when the former EPA admitted in 2016 that the air on 9-11 was not safe to breathe, even though they told everyone it was. There were many other circumstances, asbestos, for instance. We used to think that was safe. Now it's partially restricted and illegal in many countries. But the information is being purged. Anti-vaccine movie disappears from Amazon after a CNN business report. This is a canary in a coal mine. I am concerned about those who would spread misinformation about vaccines. I'm more concerned that we are creating a future where any heterodox opinion that would dare oppose what people claim to be safe will be threatened. This opens up the door for major corporations to call anyone a conspiracy theorist if we dare challenge the product they make if it's killing us. Imagine if today the cigarette industry, with all its lobbying power, claimed that their cigarettes were healthy, doctors prescribed them, and anyone who dared oppose them would have their information removed from various websites, their books banned, their social media accounts shut down, or their movies deleted from different networks. And it goes beyond general misinformation. In a news story from The Atlantic, they say Instagram is the internet's new home for hate. As other social networks wage a very public war against misinformation, it's thriving on Instagram. The narrative persists. They start with something as shocking as anti-vaxxers, people that would offend any modern sensibility. But then they quickly move to the realm of politics. They show a picture of people holding up a Q shirt and having Trump hats on. They become critical of those who would push back on their political agenda. An article that claims to push back against fake news, radicalization, and propaganda includes a quote from an individual who published fake information in an effort to connect people who are not right-wing with the fringe of the right. The same article citing a report from a group called New Knowledge that was recently implicated in producing fake accounts to manipulate an American election. The same article telling you to push back against misinformation is presenting you with quotes and reports from people who have produced fake information. And we then see the results of this rhetoric. Oliver Darcy again. Some of the people I noticed Twitter has been amplifying, Diamond and Silk, Bill Mitchell, Charlie Kirk, James Woods, Candace Owens. It seems that Oliver Darcy is upset because Twitter's algorithm is promoting what he calls extreme political rhetoric. He then goes on to highlight mainstream conservative personalities. The issue is never about what's true or false. The issue is their political agenda. Other opinions will not be allowed. The same organizations that pushed the fake news of Covington. The same media organizations that pushed the fake news of Jussie Smollett. The same organizations that were forced to pay over a million dollars for producing a discredited rape story. The same organizations that write fake news and then six months later change it and no one knows what the changes were because they already read the fake version of the story. They'll never come back for the correction. The same organizations whose writers refuse to correct fake news until they are absolutely forced to. We see it time and time again. A recent story, Twitter's CEO said the company was too aggressive in banning some accounts. The accounts in question specifically had to do with people who were using the phrase learn to code, a meme that typically appears among conservatives. People were being aggressively suspended and to this day still are. Yet these same people in media who claim to fight misinformation will tell you tooth and nail that there is no conservative bias, that there is no bias in these companies against conservatives. Even after a former Facebook employee provides 60 pages of documents proving that there is, at least to a certain extent, bias against certain individuals on the platform, they'll deny it. Even after former employees come out and say, we routinely suppressed conservative news, these same organizations will claim it's all unproven. Even after a story comes out, falsely aligning an ICE agent of having a Nazi tattoo, the individual who was disgraced gets hired to work at a journalism school, being fired for failing to do the job of journalism, but now being allowed to teach young people how to do journalism. Why? The individual is a far left activist. Those claiming to be fighting fake information are in fact those who are putting it out. I'm not saying that conservatives are always right. Of course they're not. They're wrong probably just as often. I'm not saying that these social media sites don't have extremists. Of course they do. And that's actually another part of the nightmare dystopia, the extreme radicalization of everyone from religious individuals to the left to the right. Everyone is being pulled apart, it seems. 
But some of what we're seeing was predicted. It was written about. We were warned. For instance, this quote from Fahrenheit 451. Now let's take up the minorities in our civilization, shall we? Bigger the population, the more minorities. Don't step on the toes of dog lovers, the cat lovers, doctors, lawyers, merchants, chiefs, Mormons, Baptists, Unitarians, second generation Chinese, Swedes, Italians, Germans, Texans, Brooklynites, Irishmen, people from Oregon or Mexico. The people in this book, this play, this TV serial are not meant to represent any actual painters, cartographers, mechanics anywhere. The bigger your market, Montag, the less you handle controversy. Remember that. All the minor, minor minorities with their navels to be kept clean. Authors full of evil thoughts. Lock up your typewriters. They did. Magazines became a nice blend of vanilla tapioca. Books, so the damned snobbish critic said, were dishwater. No wonder books stopped selling, the critic said. But the public, knowing what it wanted, spinning happily, let the comic books survive. And the three-dimensional sex magazines, of course. There you have it, Montag. It didn't come from the government down. There was no dictum, no declaration, no censorship to start with, no. Technology, mass exploitation, and minority pressure carried the trick, thank God. Today, thanks to them, you can stay happy all the time. You are allowed to read comics, the good old confessions, or trade journals. Censorship won't come from the government. We're protected by the First Amendment. But it will come from the private companies and from those who spread misinformation and lie to you in order to get you to beg, save us. And they will dangle extremists and the worst of the worst in front of your face. And as soon as you grant them that power, they will turn around and use it on you. I know if you're watching this, you probably already understand that. But every day I see stories like this. Every day I see people demand more censorship, more people caving in. Perhaps it really isn't as bad as it seems, because these people do tend to be a small fringe minority. Or perhaps they're actually winning. Instagram suppressing information, YouTube continuing to change its algorithm to benefit one political faction, and the bias against a certain political group of people continues to get worse. You would think that after I sat down with Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, and said, why are you banning people for tweeting learn to code? You'd think after he admitted they were too aggressive, it would stop, but it hasn't. People are still being suspended for tweeting learn to code because the machine churns on, the media bends over backwards to play into the outrage, shocked that Twitter and other platforms would dare share the opinion of a conservative. Activists rise up and demand that certain groups stop sponsoring certain shows, and thus, with that, the light of information starts to die out. And this is something that I find particularly terrifying. The reason I started doing the work that I do was because during the Arab Spring, friends of mine, hackers, people who believed in the right to share information and the right of all people to truly learn and understand, felt that there was a threat from dictators and despots. Today, the threat is coming from private companies, and it's coming from activists and people who work in media, and the incestuous relationship between the two. Because even after we see someone resign from their job in disgrace for falsely accusing someone of being a Nazi, who then goes to work for an activist organization, they get hired by a prominent university to teach journalism. And this, in my opinion, is dominoes falling over as we continue to slide down the hill into our nightmarish future dystopia. Let me know what you think in the comments below. We'll keep the conversation going. Perhaps I'm wrong. I don't think I'm always right. I don't think I'm the smartest person in the world, but I think these issues are important and they're very worrying. Comment below and let me know what you think. You can follow me on Minds at TimCast. Stay tuned. New videos every day at 4 p.m. Eastern. And I'll have more videos on my second channel, youtube.com slash TimCastNews, starting at 6 p.m. Thanks for hanging out, and I'll see you next time. Hopefully.